floor to UNICA president, Luciano Salzo. Luciano, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky, for uh, the introduction. Uh, a very warm welcome uh, from me as a UNICA president <laughs> to this important event on the digitalization of Erasmus Plus program, strategies and tools. This is a joint event uh, uh, between two important working groups of UNICA, the International Relations Officer Group and the EduLab. So for that, I would like to thank very much uh, Mina Kutaniami, the coordinator of the IR group, and Romita Yuko, the coordinator of the UNICA EduLab. Uh, this topic is very important for, for UNICA. We've been debating the Erasmus program in the last 25 years in both uh, the uh, IRO group and the EduLab. And uh, we have been actually contributing also to, I would say, the landscape of higher education with important projects such as the Erasmus uh, without paper at the beginning, I was directly involved and I'm very proud that now is really going so well after a few years. The AgraCons project, as you know, was a project that we launched, tried to optimize the conversion of the grades uh, that we give to Erasmus students. And this, as you know, is a very important also topic. And also we launched the platform iMotion, uh, which uh, should can facilitate the exchange of uh, staff members. Uh, and then we are also planning to do, uh, you know, to, uh, to work again on the emotion platform to try to improve it in the near future uh, in this uh, new digital uh, COVID uh, era. Uh, I have to say that, of course, uh, the last uh, two years have been uh, very difficult uh, due to COVID. Uh, and uh, of course, we noticed that for uh, many students and especially for uh, exchange students has been a very difficult period. But we have to say that also we noticed that there are some important opportunities for them. And we debated uh, those opportunities in UNICA in different meetings, so uh, in different groups, also with rectors, talking about uh, blended mobility, for instance, which is, I think, is a good opportunity to, to change, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the way students can be exchanged between universities. The topic of micro-credential, uh, which is very important and debated in the EduLab, and also innovative pedagogies. So I think we have to be uh, positive, even if, of course, the difficulties are there. But uh, COVID uh, gave us a very important uh, encouragement, I have to say, uh, to do things that uh, before also were possible, but for different reasons uh, were, were not done. Uh, for this event, I would like to thank very much the European Commission, and especially Nadia Manzoni, Alexandra Licht, and uh, Oana Dumitrescu. I want to thank also Vratislava Kozak, the Director of International Relations of Chelsea University, who will be one of the moderators of one of the breakout rooms. And of course, uh, the UNICA Secretariat uh, that we, you can see online today in a full uh, uh, composition with uh, Laura Brossico, Vicky Xonka, Alexandra Duarte, and Laura Colo. So I want to thank all the participants for having joined us uh, today, and I wish you a very pleasant and uh, fruitful meeting. Thank you. Now, Mina, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. So very good morning from Helsinki. It's sun is, sun is shining here and I, I think it's just perfect day to start this kind of uh, cooperation and this kind of work, workshop together. Um, I'm really pleased to see so many uh, participants involving today and I have only one wish. I wish that you all will be present. I, I hope you all will be enjoying the keynote speakers and the discussion with your colleagues. And I also hope that you all will make notes uh, and write minutes and, and write, write uh, your comments about the topics that we are discussing, especially from that point of view, that what would you like to share with your colleagues at your university and, and how that will benefit your own work and your daily life, what comes to the Erasmus program. And I also wish that you all will be really active what comes to the questions and discussions so that this is not a, an event for the organizers, this is an event for you all, all of you, you are, who are participating and enjoying this great, great event. So thank you for enjoying us and thank you for coming on to this online meeting. And I'm really uh, grateful to see you all today and, and, and to talk, talk with you later, if not today. So, Romita, please go on. Thank you very much, Mina. Uh, it's a great event also on behalf of the EduLab, uh, the second partner of organizing this event. We are very happy to share uh, ideas related not only to the teaching and learning perspective, which is very important for our uh, group, but in the same time, we are uh, creating some bridges between 
learning, teaching, and of course, a dynamics of students in this process, very important because our main purpose is to stimulate motivation of our students, deep involvement, and of course, commitment to what universities will like very much to uh, deliver in the next uh, few years. We, I'm sure that uh, we as partners, we uh, discover together with our colleagues from the GGS Education, uh, what the landscape of higher education will be redesigned according to this new proposal uh, in the next uh, few years. I am very grateful also on behalf of our group, and I'm sure that this event will contribute deeply to uh, the development of, and the readiness of our institutions uh, to, to embrace uh, what the happening news in, in our uh, segment of teaching and learning related to dynamics of the students. Thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh Hello, good morning, everybody. And while, uh, while uh, we're putting up the presentation, I just want to say we're very happy to be here. It's amazing that so many of you are interested in this topic. It's really encouraging. We are in this uh, home office for the past two years and really working really hard on this European Student Card Initiative. But it's hard to know what's happening on the ground. So uh, I see the aim of today is, is to exchange um, for us to tell uh, you what from the European Commission perspective has been happening on this big initiative and for you to tell us uh, uh, what it looks like on the ground, what are the challenges you're facing, uh, what ideas you have for the next step because we are in a really exciting phase uh, right now with this initiative and I will explain that in a minute in my part of the presentation followed by my two dear colleagues, Alexandra, who will focus on the uh, on the Erasmus Without Paper uh, and the European Student Identifier aspects, and then Noana, who will focus on Erasmus Plus app, all parts of this big initiative. So hold uh, hold on tight. Uh, it's it's uh, going to be a bit of a longish presentation, but then there's time for questions and answers and discussions and so on. So um, bear with us, okay? Thank you. So let's start. Uh, from the beginning, uh, what is even the context of this uh, big initiative? Um, the European Student Card Initiative is not is something that is really really embedded in the broader uh, policy initiative of the European Commission, uh, which you are I'm sure are familiar with the European Education Area by 2025. So it was felt that there will not be an education area, one education area at higher education level in the EU if there isn't a higher level of interconnectedness uh, and digitalization between higher education institutions in Europe. So, so we have a sort of political mandate since September last year to work on this uh, European Student Card Initiative. Um, in, in addition to the European Education Area Communication, which included this aim for uh, digitalization by 2025, we also had the communication on the so-called Digital Education Action Plan, which very clearly asked for uh, uh, some, some kind of digital infrastructure to be put in place for universities to be able to cooperate online. And um, with the rise of the European University Alliances, which I'm sure you know very well, this need has become even more prominent. We get uh, contacted practically on a weekly basis uh, by European University Alliances to say, look, if we're going to cooperate at international level, uh, if we are going to share uh, if we're going to share uh, students, staff, teaching, learning resources, we need good digital infrastructure, safe digital infrastructure uh, for this to happen. And finally, a point I wanted to make is that uh, we have envisaged this digitalization process in the process in, in, in the procedures for awarding the, the Erasmus Charter for higher education. So uh, the commitment to digitalize has already been kind of uh, pledged by um, all the ECHE holders, the holders of the Erasmus Charter who are participating in the Erasmus Plus program. Although um, it's, it was uh, done in a way that the, the first year of this new ECHE is a kind of transitionary year where there won't be any strict monitoring or sanctions for not digitalizing, but already as of next academic year, the idea uh, is that the national Erasmus Plus national agencies really monitor the commitment to digitalization among higher education institutions closely. 
So that's for the policy context. And uh, now just to remind ourselves of some more specific goals uh, of this initiative, because the name can be a little bit misleading. It is not just about the student card and you, 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 you will find out exactly what it is about. It is just a name that was chosen for this poll initiative uh, of digitalizing uh, um, the mobility experience and administration of, of, of participants in the Erasmus Plus program. And the goals are in line with the goals of the overall Erasmus Plus program. So you must have heard in some events, green, digital, inclusive, sounds a bit like buzzwords, but they really kind of all come together in this European Student Card Initiative. Um, green and Erasmus because we are hoping to switch from paper workflows to paperless workflows in the course of this new program. And it will take time. You will see we have a very progressive timeline. We're only at the very beginning. But um, if the infrastructure is built properly, then it can easily be scaled up uh, to, to, to cover other pr processes that are currently still on paper. Digital for obvious reasons, but also I want to pinpoint a, 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 a one aspect of why we're hoping to make this, why ESCI is, is contributing to a more digital Erasmus Plus, because there are, um, the aim is to have this once only principle uh, for encoding any piece of information or for authenticating, meaning the currently dispersed, you know, a, a IT tools for Erasmus Plus program management, uh, platforms for students, softwares, there are so many of them, there's big fragmentation and, and it's not efficient the way data about the Erasmus Plus students is currently entered. So the hope is to make this more efficient um, over the course of the new program. And how does this contribute to inclusion um, in the Erasmus Plus program where specifically the Erasmus Plus app uh, is, is there to create this more direct communication with the students and hopefully make information more readily available to the students uh, and, and therefore also more inclusive towards those who previously maybe did not get this kind of information delivered to. Them. Um, and finally, the, 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 the overall aim is ultimately to make the experience of the participants smoother uh, and, and, and easier and make it easier for them to, uh, to go abroad get services abroad, come back home, get information, get documents and so on. Why we are doing this? Um, we are expecting in the new Erasmus Plus program, because of thanks to the big budget increase, uh, an upward trend in mobilities. And this is this needs to be absorbed. Uh, we also have new types of mobilities. I'm sure you're aware, blended mobilities that are short term where there's more, more people going on shorter stays abroad. And uh, this administrative burden that comes with it is very well understood and known by the European Commission. And the idea is that by streamlining and digitalizing processes, there'll be some efficiency gains and more time freed up for focusing on quality of the experience and the impact it has. So this is the idea behind it. There are some more technical reasons as well. Um, GDPR compliance, This is there's a lot of personal data being exchanged uh, in the Erasmus Plus administration. Uh, and when students go abroad I and mean, when they apply for different services, cards and so on. So the idea is also that there's a more robust uh, handling of this data thanks to, thanks to these technical solutions. Um, a, a word on the European student identity. I mean, it is hopefully going to be a side product of all of this that uh, thanks to the student card, thanks to the Erasmus Plus app, the communication that will be established uh, between Erasmus Plus students, that there will be a stronger sense of, yes, I'm a European student because I move more freely between the European institutions. I have more options. I'm part of this cohort of European students. So that's kind of the vision behind it. How do we get there? Uh, and now this is where it gets a bit complicated. So bear with me. Uh, up until this point, there have been, over the years, many projects that the European Commission has financed in order to solve certain problems, like how do we digitalize the learning agreement? How do we, you know, some of them were mentioned before by Luciano, or how do we create safe, digital signatures or how do we create a student card that will give access to accommodation. So some of these were um, successful, others were just pilots and the most successful ones, some of them still running today, are 
together contributing or being merged into one big European student card initiative. And here you see the main components of them. Uh, first of all, the Erasmus Without Paper uh, project, uh, soon to be turned into a, a, a sort of um, a property of the European uh, Commission. It's, um, it's specifically the part of this initiative that deals with digitalization of Erasmus Plus administration, and at the moment, that is learning agreements and interinstitutional agreements. In the future, it will be more. So it's a, it's a way for institutions to communicate with each other in a digital space. The second one is the Erasmus Plus app, which is the student-facing uh, infrastructure. So what the students see and how they interact with the Erasmus Without Paper Network. The My Academic ID aspect is related to how do we know that a student who is coming to sign a learning agreement is really who they claim to be. So it's this very important aspect that may seem technical, but it's in, in, indispensable of student authentication and how do we how do we make sure the right person is, is, is um, signing in. And then the European Student Card, which is the aspect of identification of the student so that when they go abroad, they can, they can access certain services as it, in the same way as the local students. All of these initiatives uh, were functioning as separate projects and are in the next phases, starting from this autumn before the end of this year, being merged into one big uh, in initiative. So in the next slide, you will see what this initiative con uh, con uh, consists of. Ah, yes, I forgot that there were uh, subtitles. So the, the, on the next slide, yes, you will see um, how, how we will proceed. We are about uh, to announce a, a, a winner of a large tender for a big framework contract um, that will cover all these different aspects in two different lots or two different parts. So the, on the one hand, to um, make the Erasmus without paper infrastructure more robust, more safe, uh, more functioning, have better help desk services, better help for HEIs who are connecting to EWP, uh, a whole governance where we bring together uh, higher education institutions, third party providers, all the, all the different uh, stakeholders like students into this network and, and, and have them follow this process uh, uh, over four years. Uh, also the Erasmus Plus app, once the current contract is finished, will be integrated into this, uh, into this project and, um, and it will be run by one consortium who will be a point of call for everybody. This is the big benefit. And the second part is the European student card itself. There, this project has been a bit dormant for the past year because we've had to focus on important updates to the Erasmus Without Paper so that we can onboard institutions in time for the new program. But the student card will kick off now, the slot two will kick off now before the end of the year and really go, go into further um, uh, onboarding of higher education institutions to make sure that in the space of a few years time, uh, more and more students have their own student card turned into uh, a European student cards uh, through the addition of some holograms and QR codes, more students downloading the virtual uh, student card and then having systems in their uh, host higher education institutions accepting those cards as way of identification. So this is the idea. And a final word on, on how the commission is supporting this financially. Uh, oh no, sorry, uh, before I get there, on the next slide you will see important an important thing on the timeline of what the next years should look like in terms of digitalization of Erasmus Plus processes. But this is, please take this as a proposal. This still needs to be discussed with the community like we're doing today and to see are the systems fit for purpose? Is this possible? Do we have all the conditions in place to do so? But, but here you see a, a, a move from, from where we are today in 2021, where the learning agreements are progressively being uh, signed uh, online via the Erasmus Plus Paper Network and the interinstitutional agreements to 2022, where we need to move from the OLA for studies to also exchanging the OLA for traineeships uh, among institutions. 
and getting them signed by uh, enterprises also through the network. So still, we don't have all conditions in place for that, but the idea is to, to tackle that one next. Student nominations um, and applications, they, this is linked to the Erasmus Plus app and the fact that we'd like students to be able to apply and be nominated through the Erasmus Plus app. And therefore, there are steps that higher education institutions need to take for, uh, for them to be able to exchange this data via the Erasmus Plus uh, without a uh, paper network. This should be followed by a transcript of records exchange. And then we get into even more complicated documents to digitalize, which are the grant agreements for participants where they uh, sign a contract with their home institution only to be given uh, funds for their studies. Moving on to the learning agreement for international student mobility multilateral interinstitutional agreements between several institutions and still in 20 uh, and then in 2024 in three years time moving to staff mobility agreements international staff mobility agreements and international traineeship mobility so this is probably not exhaustive and it's probably going to change over the years, but we figured that at the start of the new Erasmus Plus program, we need to, together with the community, define exactly how this digitalization will move forward from where we are now so that everyone can be ready on board uh, and, uh, and yeah, uh, in the same boat, let's say. And finally, this is not without financial backup. So we've been very lucky that the Erasmus Plus Committee, which consists of national authorities, has recognized the need to invest in the digitalization. Uh, and, and so funds have been allocated from the 2020 Erasmus Plus Work Program and from the 2022 Erasmus Plus Work Program to go towards um, digitalization. They are big figures. Uh, I know when we look at the 4,000 higher education institutions in the Erasmus Plus Program, this dissipates, but it's important that uh, there is commitment over the years and we will continue to ask for further funds to invest into the, both digitalization and the European Student Card Initiative. Right, okay, this is where I come to, to the end of my part of the presentation, which was an overview and the, uh, on the steps ahead and where we are now. And then I pass on to Alex to give a bit more detail on the Erasmus Without Paper and the SC. Alex, the floor is yours. Yes, so uh, hi everyone, I think. So first of all, thank you, Nadia, for uh, the overview. And um, what I'm gonna do today is first to guide you to explain about uh, the Erasmus Without Paper, EWP, about ESSI, about this card. Um, and then, of course, in the breakout room, you will have more uh, place for questions and, uh, and some more detailed exchange. So what is EWP? What is the Erasmus Without Paper? So first, it aims to pave the way for Erasmus coordinators to manage mobilities more efficiently by replacing paper exchange by data exchange between IT systems. And in simple words, instead of exchanging PDFs, inst instead of exchanging uh, emails, there is a centralized system that allows uh, seamless, smooth, and easy exchange. Can you, is it okay? I heard some um, somebody saying something or no, maybe I imagined. Okay, great. So uh, yes, so this is EWP. It's a system that serves uh, HEI's uh, Erasmus coordinators now. Let's uh, go forward. So EWP network. So EWP, and we have, well, we have the Erasmus of that paper and one component is the network. So the network interconnects uh, student information systems where individual universities or third party providers that represent multiple institution through use of APIs. And what does it mean in simple words? So the network connects various HEIs, various higher education institutions, if they use their own system or they have a company that uh, manages their, uh, their IT system and it brings them into EWP. How are they doing this? Through the use of APIs, which are, uh, let's, I, I imagine it, <laughs> maybe it's a stupid um, imagination, but I imagine it as uh, connectors, okay? So like in a chain, it's a, it's a part of a chain that connects uh, one institution to another, and then there is this information flow going uh, between these, uh, these institutions. So it's a, it's a, it's a way to allow, uh, passage of data and, and exchange of data. Now, uh, 
in EWP, we said that we have the network, but we also have the dashboard. And what is the dashboard? So for HEIs, they do not have uh, their own systems or the ones that do not use software providers. So um, an external company that helps uh, in the in the IT management, uh, we provided the solution of the dashboard, and it's basically it provides a web solution for exchange of student data electronically for those uh, HEIs, where in the dashboard the data is stored, and it's a, it's an interface that we offer. But of course, this is offered mainly to uh, institutions who do not have the capacity uh, to buy software or develop one of their own. Now, that's I hope that uh, that was clear. So as a summary, we see we have HEIs having their own systems, HEIs using software providers, and HEIs using the dashboard. Okay, and the idea of all these uh, various uh, usage is to have an efficient digital way to manage Erasmus Plus mobility, to manage Erasmus Plus student mobility. So it doesn't matter if your HEI is using a dashboard, software provider, or own system, the idea that they will all be able to exchange through EWP, to exchange, exchange digitally. Now, only IIAs and OLA, so online learning agreement and interinstitutional agreements, but the idea is, as Nadia explained before, to have various documents related to the mobility, to the mobility process to be exchanged digitally. Okay, now, uh, this digital exchange, uh, we have now, as I mentioned, the OLA, the signing online learning agreements, renewing and exchanging interinstitutional agreements. And of course, uh, let's not forget, this is, it's quite revolutionary. So it's a lot of changes, many institutions, and we're talking about more than 4,000 institutions are used to do things in a certain way. So this um, digitalization and mobilizing all our efforts um, and resources for that doesn't happen in a day. And this is why this year, this academic year is a transitional year. However, uh, for all mobilities in academic year 22 and 23, all HEIs will need to use OLAs and sign IIAs digitally, which means that what we have now, the OLAs and IIAs, will be mandatory to exchange through EWP. And this is with the efforts, with the support, with the new tender, we hope that this will be possible. And we are sure that you will put all the efforts to assist your HIs, your HIs and make it possible. Now, as um, Nadia mentioned, I will just uh, briefly go over this. So we have some milestones in 22 more digitalized uh, documents in 23 and 24. And the idea is to have a fully digital mobility administration by 25. But of course, it depends also on you. It depends if you, the users, are confirming that new systems work and they work well. OK, and that was about EWP. And of course, you let's say that we have a universities exchange uh, information, exchanging uh, documents, managing mobility uh, successfully. But in the core of our business are the students. And we need to know, well, well we all know that students' mobility requires knowing both who the person is. So if the student is really that student, if John Smith is John Smith, and what is their home university? And also, I will add to that, what is the host university? And universities need to know, they need to exchange students' records. Uh, and for order, in order for us to be sure that we exchange properly, the student need to be uniquely identified. And he, this is why we have the big question and the solution as well to authentication and identification. So we must be sure that we can identify identify the student properly, and also that this student, the John Smith, is really John Smith. So how does it work? Through the project of EDSSI, uh, we came up with, or well, the project consortium uh, with the funds of the European Commission came up with the European Student Identifier, the ESSI. And what is it for exactly? So the ESSI is made to allow exchange of student records between the sending and receiving institutions and the services. 
and it also allows to exchange records and authentication of students that are separate, meaning that we I will I will just uh, tell you about the European student identifier until she comes back. So uh, the 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 point why why we are talking about the student identification and thank you for the question in the chat as well. What is the role of the EDSSI project in this? The student identifier is key. Uh, I mean, we are we are working now um, with uh, our colleagues in the VET sector, vocational education and training sector, and we very quickly and how they can digitalize their processes and very quickly we come up to the question, but how will we know that the student is who the student really is? So the student identifier in this digitalization process is, is something, it's a sine qua non. Uh, it, it, it's, it, the process without having one is, is unimaginable or, or very, very difficult. And this is why we, we are um, we this this identifier has been developed, uh, and we're asking higher education institutions to deploy an SE. Um, but it's been developed in a way that enables inst higher education institutions to use existing student numbers uh, and a few other codes that they already have, which are then put together uh, and, and, and a new number is created that is unique to every uh, student in Europe. And there's no risk of, uh, of two John Smiths being um, mistaken uh, for each other. Uh, because it, of course, happens. And uh, we are at a critical, critical moment right now. It's September 2021. And many of the functionalities of the Erasmus Plus app, for instance, uh, let me take the example of a, a, a student, a European student card, a virtual European student card. It will only be able to function if the student who is logging into the app has been given a European student identifier, then that same student can be led to the uh, online learning uh, uh, agreement platform where they can sign the learning agreement. If we don't know who they are when they're logging in, we cannot let them sign or there are problems in signing and many other functionalities are linked to this. Um, there is a process to help higher education institutions do this. Um, it, it is um, possibly a bit technical, but I can try and, and, and explain that um, in order for, for a student to easily log into the Erasmus Plus app or the OLA or other Erasmus Plus paper systems, what um, we have developed through previous projects is that when a student logs in via their normal university network, which is EduGain, for instance, the European student identifier is automatically attached like a backpack onto this uh, authentication. And the system in which the student is logging in recognizes, ah, I see the backpack, it's this number, it's this student. So I don't need to ask them all these other questions. I know who they are and I can uh, safely let them in. So this is um, uh, both the reason why we're asking HEIs to deploy SE so they can already start, even though we're in a transitional year, so that the students can already start benefiting from the Erasmus Plus app and from this single authentication process starting now from September. But also, this is why you have possibly heard of stories of EduGain and the whitelist and, and uh, IDPs of last resort and my academic ID. I mean, I don't know if this rings a bell, but we have mobilized hundreds of institutions uh, over the summer uh, who were not able to use EduGain uh, for their student authentication to uh, start a process of manually giving the European student identifier to their students via the My Academic ID platform. So not to bore you with too many technical details, this is now ongoing. And uh, I mean, if you have further questions, we can discuss them later. But the main takeaways when it comes to the SE is that things cannot function properly, all this digitalization uh, services cannot function properly if we cannot identify students. They can, but with very, um, with very limited uh, effect. So we, we, we're not going to exclude students who don't have one. We are in a transitional year. We have continued allowing Google logins as an alternative, but we really want to implore to move away from Google. It is not as safe as other login methods and it doesn't carry the SE. Ah, and I think Alex is back. Yes, I'm sorry. Great. I actually no I have problem. works on my street. Then maybe no problem. It's that. 
that. So I reconnected with my phone, but why it happened? So I might just keep my um, camera off so you could at least be sure that we have the that we have uh, the presentation. Again, my, my apologize for this. So I will just stop uh, from where, I will start from where I stopped. I so just that explained, I yes. yeah, just, I just explained a bit uh, while you were gone, the, why we why we are at the critical moment right now with the SE uh, and why is it why is it important uh, for universities to deploy it? What so so you can you can start from um, from the page of how does it work? Yes. Okay. Okay. So did we? Okay. So how does it work? Did you explain about uh, how? Yeah. Okay. I think we can, I can go through this. So what, how does it work? How the European student identify work? So the student mobility Alex, requires sorry, you. Sorry, I'm sorry yeah? to, to jump in, but we can't see the slides. Shall we uh, share the screen? Let Would me it be re helpful or, uh, or can you do that? You... Yes, yes, it works now perfectly. Okay. Okay. Actually, you can go, yeah, you can go from this slide. That's good. Excellent. Okay. So the question is, what is this SC, this identifier? How does it work? So student, uh, the mobility process requires several services uh, and all these services, they need to carry with them specific data uh, on this specific student. So the European student identifier, it's, it's globally unique. So it's a unique number. It's not repeated. It cannot be the same for another student. It's persistent. It follows the student wherever he or she go. It's not targeted, which means it only carries the information that is requested uh, for it to carry. And it's protocol neutral and data transport neutral, which means it doesn't matter which kind of system the HEI uses, if it's an open or not, uh, the SE is not affected by the type of IT infrastructure within the specific HI. I see you're all frozen, but I hope you can still um, we can follow hear the you. presentation. Okay. And I hope you can see the presentation. So how, can you pl please confirm that, that you can see the presentation? It's okay. Can you hear us, okay. It's fine. It's perfect. Great. Okay. So how does it work? There is various codes, the country code, the shack code, the personal, the, the shack code, the personal and unique code of a student, the country code, and then the institution's code. So this is how it looks like. So a very uh, long, however, a uh, unique number. And it is reliably identified students across different e-services. And for more information, you can check uh, this uh, wiki by Jean who developed uh, this code. Um, and of course, the presentation will be shared with you so you could check all the hyperlinks. Now, uh, how does it work exactly? So we have various ways to enter the system, uh, whether it is through EduGain, which is a federated, uh, for HIs that are in the federation, they use EduGain, whether it is a Google login, which is, as Nadia mentioned, an option that is currently existing, but will be phased out as it's not the most secure well, we want to make sure that we have 100% security. And also this uh, symbol that represents the EIDAS or EID. So in certain countries, as Belgium, for example, there is a possibility to, um, to identify electronically. So in Belgium, for example, it's the It's Me. In other countries, there are their own identifiers. Then. Uh, when the student is identified, the, the identification process happens. They go through the My Academic ID. This, it's not the portal, but it's like, let's say it's a proxy. This identification passes them to a various services offered by Erasmus Plus, the app, the dashboard, OLAs, and so on. So the student identifies. There is the proxy of My Academic ID says, okay, the student identified, we have the information and we send the details to these various services. The data also comes back and all this information is possible via the SC. And I hope you're still with me because I still see you all frozen. It's perfect. We can hear you perfectly. Excellent, great, thank <laughs> no you. Problem. Thank you. 
I'm just making sure I'm not talking to myself for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah do so. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. Great. Okay. Now, what's the state of play? So, the big majority of HEIs, of HEA holders, of higher education institutions, are uh, the use EDU game, which means they're part of federated institutions and they issue or should issue or are on the way to issue European student identifier so it will allow their students to authenticate in EWP. And here this is the attribute release so all the technical information can be seen um, in these links. But also, of course, this is the majority, but not all. Many other ECHA holders have their national IDP solutions. So for the one, these HIs that are not federated in certain countries like Poland, like France, Italy, Spain, and so on, uh, there is a solution on a national level. So an authentication and identification solution managed on a national level, which in the end allows the same um, the same possibilities as Edugain, for example, and around 500 institutions, um, and hopefully they will become less and less, they, uh, they don't have a national solution, they don't have uh, Edugain, they're not federated, and for these institutions, which are mainly smaller institutions with maybe uh, limited capacity, uh, they're deploying an identity provider of last resort, which means these institutions are listed and um, there is a leng lengthy and, and not very simple process in order to be to to allow them to join, to be to, to allow those institutions to authenticate their students. And of course, um, this process it requires uh, an IRO checking and entering every, uh, all the details about the students. It's quite a uh, resources uh, consuming process. And that's why we hope that many institutions that are currently in the white list will slowly pass uh, to Edugain, which is actually happening slowly. But for those institutions who are not, and I guess they, I'm sure that they know who they, I mean, they know what what are the situation in the institution. You can find all the information in this wiki. So what are the benefits of SC for students? So students will be able to authenticate, sorry, here it's my, my mistake, students will be to authenticate themselves, their student status online, and it's reliable, consistent, and a safe way. So students can obtain information. What, what is the students, where their learning agreements send, uh, are they uh, accepted to mobility and so on. Students will be able to use their academic credential to access multiple student e-services through uh, one single entry, uh, entry point. So which means they log in and they can access various um, services, but without needing to put again a login and again authenticate and again authenticate. And students are able to use their EID, but that's again for the for uh, the ones that in their countries there is um, an EID solution to enroll in higher education institutions and link their citizen and student digital identities. In simple words, what it means for students that with one identifier they can obtain more services without the need to log in and re-log in. And this information is carried out throughout their uh, education. And in countries that there is the, in, an EID, in, in countries that EID or EIDAS are deployed, which it means that only uh, even, let's say, um, that the students can even enroll to the higher education with this with this identification that allows them to make um, it, how can I say it in a more simple words? So basically one login uh, that can serve them also to all their citizen, citizen related uh, tasks will be the same also for the Erasmus process. Now, uh, what is the benefit of ATIs? And this is the slide I took from the My Academic ID project slide and you can find the whole presentation online and i think this is a very useful slide so again not um, the rights are reserved for my academic id project uh financed by the european commission but basically the situation and 
now it's not so current, but still we have various, uh, we're in the transition year. So it's occurring in several, in some institutions, but in some, or they're already in here in this uh, stage. So we have different identity providers and we have different services. So we can see that we have uh, various services offered, but also various identity provider. And the goal, what we're trying to do is uh, to bring these identi identity providers like Edugain, like EIDAS, and so on. And here we can add also um, the national IDP or the IDP of last resort through the My Academic ID proxy. We issue ESSI and this ESSI students can access more services, the Erasmus Plus app. So do actions on the app, receive information, be able to, to do activities related to their mobilities on the app, such as the, uh, the learning agreement, but also this SE follows them to the European student card, which again is linked to the app and allows students to have services related on campus or off campus related to the card. So this in, I'm, this is a, uh, a way a simple way to explain a not very simple process. Now, uh, what is the benefit of deploying SC4 HEIs? So HEIs, you guys will be offered to, uh, you offer to your students to manage their mobility digitally. It facilitates the process for students, but it also means an increase of students going on Erasmus because the process becomes easier it's not so complex they do not need to put credentials again and again and to submit documents again and again it provides students with a link to the european student e-card so uh, the se is also reflected in in the e-card now it also allows students to manage the mobility administration in an easy and simple way and of course it allows students to be ready and your institutions so it, it allows to your institution to be ready to future digitalization processes. As Nadia said, as I explained in the beginning, we will have various documents in various parts of the mobility digitalized. So if your institution is already issuing SE or on the way to issue SE, it, it, uh, it will make it more simple in the future. Now, what about the card? So we mentioned the European student card. So your European student card is built we're building on an existing project and you can see here the project logo and you can also go online and search search for this project also financed by the commission so the european student card now with the new tender we're really uh, taking a step uh, forward with this card so first we're talking about two el two elements of this card the first one is a physical card so we're adding a european hologram and a qr code to existing student cards which means there, we don't need to now issue uh, thousands of new cards. We're just adding an element to provide a European identity and to provide a possibility to uh, and to provide a possibility also to access all the information that's related to SE. Now the electronic card carries the data with the help of SE, and this data allows students to be able to access services and play, pay online. For example, libraries, payments, catering, services on and off the campus, book a travel, transport, and so on. And of course, this is, we're really in the beginning. So this, this is the vision for the European student card. Uh, now uh, we already have uh, several thousands of cards uh, issued with a European hologram and a QR code and the cards uh, and already there is a link of the of the European student card the SE in the app but of course we're in the beginning of the way and not many institutions are deploying SE as we said it's a process it doesn't happen in one day and uh, the digital transformation here that we're doing is is a big step forward so this is what we foresee for the future. And I hope that you are still with me. We are, we are here. Excellent, you know, great. To you. So uh, thanks for your attention. I know that it was, uh, um, let's say, quite intense for the SC and the cards.
Uh, but for the questions, we I saw that there were already questions in the chat, but it might be good instead of taking them now, because I see we're also running out of time. I'll pass the floor to my colleague, Juana, that will uh, provide you with an explanation and it might already reply to many of your questions. And then we'll look at the questions later. Juana. Thank you, Alex. Will you be okay? Thanks for moving the slides. Thanks. Uh, so, hello, everyone. First of all, my name is Juana Dumitrescu. I work together with Nadia and Alex in the DG EAC in the Higher Education Unit. And today, I'll talk to you more about the Erasmus Plus app, which is the component of the European Student Card Initiative that offers students this kind of single entry point or access to this simplification and digitalization through the program. Slide. <laughs> Great. So as I was saying, this is uh, the whole idea behind the app is this kind of simplification and digitalization on the beh on behalf of the students, on the part of the student. And the idea behind the app came in 2017 with um, um, the 30 years of Erasmus campaign. So we launched this product in 2017 sort of to, to promote and offer more information about Erasmus Plus. And on the basis of the product that was created, then we have now been redeveloping it to really integrate all the functionalities that my colleagues were talking about and give students the ability to access them through this kind of very simple way, an application on a mobile phone or um, um, a website as well, making it more accessible for different, for it to be accessed in different ways and for different students. So the idea behind it is to offer, to kind of guide the student throughout the whole um, mobility journey. So first of all, the, the application um, kind of accompanies the student throughout the stages of mobility by offering them information. Uh, the idea is if you have questions about Erasmus Plus that you can download this and you find a lot of information there. Um, first of all, through the information that is there, but also by exchanging with other peers, with student organizations and so on. Um, students can also research partnering universities and courses because of course um, uh, your higher education institutions would have already included the details um, in the EWP network and then the, the student easily has access to the options that are available to them. They are able to simply uh, sign their online learning agreement via the app and, and manage it. Um, but also connect with activities um, uh, surrounding it. The app also offers um, the ability to showcase a virtual European student card on the mobile app. Um, slide. Uh, there's a series of app features because as I was saying, there's two, um, in fact, I haven't said so far, but there were two releases of the application. So in February, you might have heard that there was a first release of the app. So it was the first revamping um, of the app, uh, which basically created the, the new design, kind of uh, put forward some of the the, the features that, that exist at the moment, which is offering more information, offering tips um, and deals to students that could be showcased on the app. So as you, as you can see in the first release, we have these kind of um, features that are already out there and that we have launched with the purpose of kind of promoting it to the students so that they can get accustomed to the app and they can populate it with relevant information from a local context. But on a second release, which is foreseen for next week, actually, we will have available all of these functionalities that we were talking about, which is the connection with the EWP network, the ability to manage administrative procedures, and the virtual European student card, as I was saying before. Um, so as you can see, you can also uh, find the prom uh, promo toolkit online on the hello.erasmusapp.eu. Uh, so what it's very important um, for you to have kind of the, the, pro the right promotional material in place so that you can make this available to your students to, to um, give it visibility so that it's, it's uh, widely used and accepted um, among the student population. So you can already access it right there. And we have a number of materials that are available to you in different languages. Slide. Um, so we have 20 visuals for social media use, which you can use for the different types of social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn, which uh, they are basically uh, adjusted for, for each of these social media um, 
interfaces, I don't know how to say, channels, channels. I'm getting old, I don't know how to say these things anymore. Um, and uh, we have the tagline, your Erasmus Plus in one app, but also other different key messages uh, for this slide, please. Um, you can also reuse uh, materials for the printing pack, for roll-ups, posters, flyers, and brochures, which are found online. Um, and we're constantly, we say here, translations by fall 2021, the translations are already, have already been done, and they're slowly being uploaded on the, on the, the website, so you'll be able to find it in all your languages. We're also working on a Google Ads campaign so that we, um, we make the, the app as visible as possible. I always like to say, here that if you, you know, those very annoying YouTube ads that, that you get when you're trying to watch a trailer or the latest movie or something, you're probably gonna uh, see one of one of, with, with our app as well soon enough, hopefully. Uh, and yes, the second release event will happen next week on the 21st of September. You can register here. We will be sharing the slides with you. And it will really showcase a dialogue between the commissioner and students, as well as showcasing the functionalities of the app. The idea behind it is to really have an interaction between um, kind of the political level, the student level, and to, to uh, discuss a bit the connections between um, why the app is important in this process of digitalization and how it kind of uh, interconnects with Erasmus+, Plus, but also to, to showcase the functionalities and, and kind of guide people through, um, through using them. And I think this was my last slide. Oh, we will also have a tips competition. So basically students can add and submit their, their tip. This is kind of a way to attract students to actually start downloading the app and using it. So that's why we are launching this competition, but we're also having this angle of kind of what is the most popular Erasmus Plus destination based on the, the tips. So kind of it encourages both students and higher education institutions to, to kind of join us in this exercise and, um, and uh, download the app and, and basically uh, get engaged and popular with the right information. So this is kind of where we are right now. We hope that you register and you join us for the webinar next uh, next week. And we hope to be able to answer some of your questions or thoughts in, um, in uh, the minutes to come or in the sessions. Well, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, we are running a bit off behind the schedule, but it's uh, not a problem, I think. Um, uh, we have gathered uh, the, the questions uh, that, that uh, the participants uh, wrote in the chat. So I will also um, send it um, to all the co-moderators of the breakout room so then you, you can keep discussing about these questions. So during the comfort break, um, I will take care of this. Um, my question would be to Nadia, Alex and Doana, if you would like to answer some of the questions yes. right at the moment as we are going to have a Q&A section now. Okay, great. Um, at, least, at least those, I mean, I try to answer some of them in the chat box, uh, the ones that are easily answerable in, in a short uh, answer, but there are at least two that I would like us to address because, I mean, thank you for challenging us. They are, it's good exactly to have this kind of discussion. The one is on, on the added value of the app and how it will be integrated with the EWP infrastructure. So I, I'd like to take that one if that's okay. And the other one is the explanation on, on, on the learning agreements, why in this transitional year, why we can't allow paper learning agreements. Is it okay that we take those? Um, yeah, okay. So on the first one, uh, thank you for raising this. Uh, is it Karen? Um, and for Karen and for um, problematizing this uh, link between the Erasmus Plus app and the EW infrastructure. There are two things that are important to say here from, uh, from our end. So the launch of the app next week and the second release of the app should be seen like this. It is a, uh, an app that has great potential. <laughs> it has great potential for being the single entry point for students if this is the choice of the higher education institutions to use it as such. So um, there is now a period now that the app developers have sort of finished their job, now is a period where 
we have to make this app useful to the students and it will be up to the HEIs to choose, okay, will the app be something I will encourage my students to use? Is it something I need or do I have alternative solutions? You might, you might have alternative. I mean, we're, we're not saying the app is now compulsory and every student should use it. That's not the point. So um, I, I really want to make this clear that the app is there in case you see an added value of it. We definitely think there is one, but if there are better solutions, go ahead. I mean, there are institutions that have their own apps that are so big that they can make use of them. That's one point I wanted to make. So that so the, the, the message comes across that without the involvement of HEIs, the app will probably be useless. I mean, it's, it, we, of course, there are, there are elements of the app like that are student to student. So students share tips, students share events, students exchange, there's a body system. So that will always be there. There's an element which is information sharing where, where we have just, we have translated and made available in a more user-friendly way, a lot of information because we believe it will become, be it, it's part of making the Erasmus Plus more inclusive. But there's an element of the app which is about the institution interacting with the student and vice versa. And that part will, will entail development, software development on the side of institutions, um, APIs and so on, especially on application, nomination, transcript of records and so on. So um, that part will have to be a conscious choice of the HEIs. Yes, I want to make the Erasmus Plus app uh, available to my student for this purpose, and I will instruct my IT teams to do A, B, C in order for this to, to work. So please don't take the app next week as, okay, here it is ready, students, everything's there for you to use. So it's the beginning of, of fulfilling of a potential of the app, should it be used. And there is at least, I mean, there are several years of process that will follow after this launch next week that will that will hopefully make the app more attractive. You have to uh, present it like that. It, it, it's a work in progress. It has the potential to become a useful tool, but this is the start of this process. So I wanted to uh, say that uh, here. And on the learning agreement, um, it's a good question. So what, what does this transitional year mean? Alex, uh, I don't know if you want to take this one, uh, but maybe just as an introduction, you know, the transitional year is, uh, nece was necessary. We would have loved that, you know, just, we just choose a date and from this date onward, everyone is digitally exchanging, but it's just such a complex process. There's so much work behind. These connections to EW network are so complicated. There are, like Alex said, there are institutions which have had to uh, um, integrate systems, their own in-house IT systems to the EWP network to be able to appear there in the registry. Others have had to go on the dashboard. There's 2,000 of them. We expected 500 or something. So the dashboard itself needs, it has issues. Uh, we are perfectly aware of that uh, and are going to put money into its improvement with this new tender. Others uh, rely on private software providers to link to the EWP and they are not paid to do this. We the idea was that a higher education institute that it will be so commonplace and so taken for granted that we digitalize that HEIs as clients will require from their software providers to join EWP. Uh, so we are it's a goodwill process in which we are trying to collaborate with third parties with private providers to to uh, to make this link to EWP so that their clients can be discoverable in this uh, in this network and that they can exchange data so th that process is taking time so that's what this transition means we give all institutions time over the course of a year um, to connect to EWP and to be discoverable in EWP so that learning agreements and interinstitutional agreements can be exchanged um, digitally uh, eventually, but we had to keep up the pressure. Otherwise, if we just kept saying, you know, take your time, join in, it, it would never work. And many institutions are coming to us and saying, my partners are not discoverable on the network. How am I supposed to digitalize? And that's exactly the kind of pressure we want to create, peer pressure for everyone to join in EWP, because that, that's, that's uh, we found the best way to, to digitalize, to get everyone on the network as soon as possible. Uh, hi, this is Renata who <laughs> asked the question Renata. from Zagreb. Hello. So the problem, you know, I think the, what the problem is, it's not only with the OLAs, but also with the uh, IIAs, the agreements. Yeah. Now we have, I have this here, my colleague Ratimira, who is just waiting for our 
faculties to say because faculties arrange um, agreements because of the on the subject they, they, they know more uh, and uh, uh, then they come centrally to us so we are waiting for a lot of agreements to start a new for the new period and uh, we had every week we have a question like we we would like to postpone this for uh, January, February, because we are building our in-house system. So it's not only OLA, it's I think every aspect of uh, digitalization. So, and yeah. uh, I know I, I get it that we have to find some middle solution and to, if we can make it digital, but the problem is because we are using, for some APIs, we are using a dashboard for some, we are using oh, yes. our in-house move on. And when we will switch to move on, so like for the party from provider, uh, some data, I think some data will be lost of students for like for all us. So this is my big concern. And maybe something should be done there that the, I know because we are, when we changed internally our um, databases, you can take, uh, data and transfer it in some shape into the another. So maybe this is something yeah. that should be, uh, I think everything has a solution, especially digitally uh, related. And uh, just, uh, if I can say just one um, sentence, one word about um, Erasmus app, I see it as a possibility, but uh, we received uh, through, I don't know, th uh, through our national agency, this um, invitation for now in September for webinar for um, uh, Erasmus app and for student webinar in October, I think. There will be two presentations, I think. Yes, okay. actually the second one is for for institutions, but both okay. are interesting for you as someone who works on this. So okay, so for week, me, this is not logical because I think first, I think should be, um, institution should be prepared to give and uh, present something to students. And I, now I'm afraid to launch this, to send this email to students, and we didn't have time to prepare. We were struggling with all us. We were struggling with uh, IAAs. And the very, I don't know if other university have, universities have this experience, but our students didn't stop go on mobility because of the pandemic. They just go. There are so many hundreds of students going and coming to Zagreb. So this is like, national agency was like surprised. How come? But we are, I don't know, open country and uh, we are managing it. We have it some places online. It depends on the state of the pandemic. So we are really struggling. And uh, just to say a last thing, it's excellent. We have this inclusion for everybody and this short mobility, blended mobility. But behind it is a big administrative load. And uh, so this is, we didn't even have time to take, to take time to, for, to see what Erasmus app, app um, offers to our institution, to students. So a lot of possibilities at once. And we didn't have time to digest and to present it to our students and our faculty. So, oh, okay, I will stop now. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you sharing this, really. Uh, I think that th the key is not to present it, like I said before, as a ready finished product, but to start exploring it. This event next week will be about showing what the app can do if, uh, if students choose to download it and if universities choose to use it. So we will sh have demonstrations uh, of the different functionalities that could potentially be used. Many of them will be available immediately, even if you as university are not ready to yet connect, you know, uh, sign online learning agreements. I mean, that if you're not, that option will simply not be available to your students who join in with, your, with the SC that, that they have. But there are other options, functions that will be immediately available to them uh, and they'll be able to benefit from, from them. So, just to present this event next week as a as a launch um, for students to familiarize themselves with the app to see what what are what are the possible options they can use it for, and then in the period I mean it will take a a, a long 
time. It will take a, a year or so, at least, to for institutions to really figure out how they're going to use it. So you will progressively keep communicating to your students about what they can do through the app. But for now, you can, I think, you can present it as a as a first presentation of what the potential of the app is. You know, rather than a, okay, from now on, we're using the app. And you said quite a few other things as well uh, that, uh, that Sorry. I, no, no, it's okay. I, I picked up on some of them. I wanted to maybe say something about the IIAs or maybe my colleagues, Alex, uh, my colleague Alex can say about what we have recently communicated to the national agencies about IIAs in this transitional year. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So sorry. basically we... I'm sorry, just a very brief comment so that we are running a bit uh, behind the time. My question would be if... Uh, so if you can just recap it very quickly, that's great. Otherwise, we could uh, continue the discussion in the breakout rooms and also in the second Q&A. So uh, we can also reschedule the, a bit the program or restructure. So if you think it's important to address these questions right here, right now, then do this it. This one, as this you one, think it's, just this okay. one. Okay, let's do so. Yes, so for the IAAs, there was a note sent to the uh, directors of the national agencies where we clarify with the situation as we had many questions of uh, are the IAAs valid also? Uh, can we exchange on paper also next year? And are they still valid? And how does it work? So basically, we encourage all institutions to start exchange digitally. But in case that, um, for in case that an institution has already exchanged with another institution, they already have an agreement, but one of them is not ready to go digitally, uh, the exchange can be done, all the agreement can be done beforehand on paper saved. And then when both institutions are ready to go digitally, you upload it online. So the information will be uh, on EWP. So both institutions will go online. In case that both of them are not ready, they prepare everything. And again, same as before, they wait. And when they're ready, they go online. The only exception, uh, only exception of uh, exchanging digit, uh, of exchanging on paper, and here, please correct me, Nadia, if I'm wrong, is when there is a new ETCHA holder, which are not yet uh, ready to, to exchange online. They're just, uh, they just arrived and they're not yet on EWP, or they didn't have any other agreements with uh, other institutions. This is the only exception. Can I just comment a bit? Because this is a really big issue when uh, they, we have to use the Erasmus dashboard right now at our uh, university. And to actually make uh, this agreement digitally, uh, if we were going to do all of our agreements, it would cost us 600 hours just to edit uh, to enter this information digitally. And that's just on our part. That's before starting sending it to other partners. And we experience so much bugs and difficulties and errors that this will potentially cost us uh, at least one new whole year work uh, for, uh, for the university. And we don't simply have that kind of money because we also have budget cuts for administration from our governments. So the fact that the, the system, the infrastructure, it's not mature enough, the systems are definitely not mature enough to, uh, to enter all of this information, makes this extremely costly and difficult for the highs. Of course, and this is very much, I mean, we know the situation, it's not simple, it's not simple situation. And I hear your frustration, I hear, I hear your frustration and I understand it, but this is why we have a new tender that will bring and will streamline all the process of digitalization. The idea that the systems will become more mature, the idea and their funds dedicated for further development, for further incorporation of all the necessary elements to make your work more simple. So what I will suggest in that case and all the other cases, which I, I'm sure that many of you share uh, Karen's experience, is until you are ready, you can, if both partners are ready to exchange digitally, do your best to exchange digitally. 
If one of the partners are still not ready, you can prepare everything. And when both partners are ready, you go and exchange digitally. And of course, we know that the system is not perfect, but this is why it's being developed. This is why there is so much investment coming in. And we're talking about in the upcoming weeks, we're going to publish uh, we're going to publish the results of the tender and start to work with the consortium on all these improvements. So I hope, Karen, that next time that we'll discuss, you would say, well, I see that there were some improvements and things work because this is this is exactly why we're pumping so much money, resources and and men force to, to that. And I can say that all the what you just mentioned, we're fully aware of that. We're not just expecting everyone to magically uh, exchange digitally it it needs a lot of mobilization a lot of effort but as nadia said if we would not if universities would wait for the others to be ready it would not happen so we uh, what we invite you to do is to push as much as possible from your side to push to issue essay to push to go to connect to the network to try to do your best but also to know that funds are coming and things will become better they will become better we're working on that there is no other way it should become better and i, I hope that that gave a bit of a you know the the light in the end of the tunnel but because we we fully understand you but that's why and i'm you know i'm repeating myself but i want to reinforce you to say that your efforts would not be for vain they would not be lost thank you very much i think this is the moment when uh wishes stop and grab a coffee um much um okay then let's start with the reporting i would like to ask uh, all the all the three um moderators or deliverers to just focus on the main messages uh, as we are still running a bit uh behind the schedule so the first uh would be um our colleague from breakout room one alexandru i can't see you now here on the screen but uh Hopefully yes, you can hear me out. Hello yes, everyone, yes. thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, I'll, I'll try to be as short as possible in order to provide the time for everything. Well, uh, in our breakout room, there were very interesting discussions on the Erasmus Without Paper project, and they were kind of like constructed upon sharing of practices and experiences that some of the university already have with the tools that were used, and well, of also the challenges that appear uh, on that. So, uh, we identified kind of like two main areas of ideas. One was the strategic or the policy perspectives in which uh, starting from the, the European Universities Alliance's projects and their involvement in developing these tools and, uh, and instruments to be used, we, we, thought that, we saw that uh, uh, the Erasmus Without Paper project is a very important tool for this project also because the universities the consortiums need these tools in order to provide for common educational offers and platforms and, and such common joint uh, developments uh, between the university and of, and of course the exchange of data between those universities. And of course that there are still challenges from technical paths in order to develop instruments, common instruments. And the second main area was the infrastructural or the technical part in which um, our colleagues talked about, for example, a better need for spreading information and reaching out for information on single platforms. And of course, the need for a, a, a translation of the language from the IT perspective, the IT language, more to the international officers language, so to call it. And of course, uh, the need for a better involvement of the national agencies in order to support the universities in providing these tools and in implementing them in universities in order so that the universities are not uh, constrained to use only uh, own instruments and in a, in a uh, individual mode, so to call it. And also some technical challenges that go, of course, with the IT components, the development side, and how the personal uh, technical platform of the universities can merge with the European, European ones. 
uh, in hope I've, I've covered the main ideas that were, were discussed. This would be our report from breakout, breakout room one. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Then let's move to breakout, breakout room two. So, Bratislav, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vicky. Well, to summarize it, in case of the working group two, where we were speaking about the European Student Card Initiative, there is there is an issue of, of a fear that so much time and, and effort has been put into the EVP network and working on Erasmus without paper, then there is not that much actual focus on the rest, on the EduGain, on the My Academic ID initiative, because, for example, most of the colleagues has have the same issue with the centralized IT office when they don't have an IT guy on their international office relations. And in that case, they are trying to push the idea how important Erasmus Without Paper is right now. And there is now the need to spread the position of these IT offices, not only working on the EVP, but also thinking about the data protection of the students, thinking about the My Academic ID initiative and stuff like that. So that, that's a big problem for some of the universities and even for the national agencies. And for example, we have some that are really pushing the EVP without actually thinking that much about the EduGain slash My Academic ID initiative. Also, there was a big, big question of some national solution being used for all of this, all this data, data protection uh, initiative projects and that there is not enough time for a national solution to, to be created because we have some some almost firm deadlines that we have to keep as universities when actually speaking about the digitalization of Erasmus project or program. And in the, the last part was about actually the Google access into the ASI and how most of the institutions still are running on the Google Google aspect and that we cannot or the EC cannot basically jump start it without the, the Google being in it or involved because then more than half of the institutions that are needed will have to, to find a very quick and very different solution from, from the Google access into the ESI. So that, that a proper way to scale it, the data protection for, for the future is actually working on that as well. and. The biggest biggest problem we're not finding enough time next to the EVP initiative. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And now we are moving to the last breakout room. Mina. Yes, thank you, Vicky. So there were twenty five of us talking with Oana, and we had really fruitful discussion about four topics. I would say the first one is like a tip for the for the. Um, for the, those who are uh, actually um, developing the student Erasmus app, we were discussing that the Erasmus coordinators, those who are actually uh, active uh, organizing uh, Erasmus exchanges, they need to know how the app is working from the student perspective. And we were discussing that we will need like the uh, the over we need the overview of the app, but we also need to know how it. Uh, what's the content for the students and how they use it, because the students are asking from us uh, about it and, and the content of it. And, and so we did, agreed that we will follow up this team and Anna will like deliver the message uh, for, the, for those who are uh, building up the app that there should be material for us to, to cover this in the future. We were talking about the future also what comes to the next steps. And, and now we know that the dashboard and, and, and the Erasmus app is connected, but quite many of us are using Move On or Mobility Online or other uh, IT solutions. And, and it would be lovely to hear the timeline when, when the Erasmus app is connected to these IT uh, solutions, for example. And, and then we were also talking about um, uh, that there are quite many paperwork still for our teaching native exchange students, like let's say certificates of the arrival and stay. And we are really keen to know when we can give up those papers as well. And, and when we can use, for example, the app um, uh, for them uh, to, to somehow sign them in a more simpler way than nowadays. And then the third topic was the student organizations and, and activities that the students have uh, independently with themselves and, and how they are organized, for example, through ESN and so on. And for example, the, the student body programs and so on. And we discussed 
how the student app could uh, you know promote that kind of activities and 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 share the knowledge and information there and i know that that's that's happening already and the fourth topic was that um, when we were talking about uh, what the Erasmus app is covering at the moment, uh, of course, we are really thankful that later on the blended mobilities and international mobilities are also included into that. But there was an idea that maybe we could use the app in the future also for those uh, activities and exchanges that we have among European universities. Uh, uh, without Erasmus program, without Erasmus funding, let's say, for example, the uh, summer school exchanges or the exchanges among uh, European universities alliances, because the process is the same, uh, the, the um, surrounding is the same, the universities are the same, so it would be lovely to have that opportunity there as well. So that was our ideas and our talk. Great, thank you very much. Um, do you have a comment on this, uh, Nadia, Oana, Alex, or any of the other co-moderators? Um, I wrote down so many good ideas. I mean, just rest assured that we are really listening uh, to the ground, to what, what you're saying. And this really helps us in, in steering the work of, of, of contractors. There was one question on the timeline um wanna help me which timeline there were there were several mentioned uh, on the link between the erasmus plus app and the third party providers yes please yes no, i we i cannot give you an exact um, exact timeline i'm afraid so we have started um, talking about the current contractor uh, about this because it it became obvious that that we need, we cannot be exclusionary with the app and that it has to be at least offered even to those institutions who use software providers. Even though on the other hand, we, we sometimes hear from them as well. This is our work. We have other student interfaces, don't meddle with us. But the, after discussing, we, we, we said, okay, at least the link has to be established. Then whether a university is gonna use it or prefer to instruct their students to continue using their own software, it's up to the university. So we realized that this was a big missing link in the current way that the app is functioning. So we started some preliminary talks, but it was obvious that this is going to be an expensive project. So we have included it in the new tender um, that is going to be launched now. As I cannot give you more precise timeline, just reassurance that it's one of the tasks that we will uh, start working on. Uh, uh, probably in the already in the first phases of the tender. And there was another question on the timeline that I was not very sure. I think it's more you and Alex who have a bit of a better overview on this. When different documentation will be available digitally and also via the app. So we 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 this is too early to say right now. So mm -hmm. uh, just to to reassure you, we have we have to. Um, as part of this new tender, we have to sit down with the new contractor that will be announced hopefully this week and really create this plan of action, this project charter, uh, as you, if you wish, because this is now just one big massive digitalization process. Uh, and uh, this will be then discussed and communicated with the national agencies and with the HEIs when it's fixed. What we are current, what we showed you those slides about what is, what we propose, it gets digitalized uh, each year. That is really just a, just a skeleton, um, man, much more analysis has to go into it for it to be fixed, and then we will communicate it more, more broadly. Great, meanwhile, other questions are coming uh, in the chat. So I think it would be interesting to address them. There was uh, one before uh, asked by Helena. Um, is the EWP team checking the operation of connecting to EWP before the institutions go to production? Our IT company would like to test with some universities, but some mistakes were discovered during the process. Uh, so, I'm. Uh, this is a bit to Alex. Uh, sorry, did you want to reply? Yeah. Ah, yeah, go. No, it, I, my answer that, uh, so the question is, are there testing done in a regular basis before they're going on production? And the answer is yes. So now the third party providers, the software providers are busy in testing. And this testing takes 
text process. The testing, uh, also the records are published by the current contractor in order for all other providers to be able to, to see what is the situation and what is missing, what are the errors, learn from the errors. So the testing is done before going to production, but of course, as you, as you might know, maybe some errors are div are discovered in the later stage, so that can also be the case. But for specific HEIs, this is not the information that we we don't have such information about specific testing in specific institutions. Okay, thank you. Um... In the first uh, Q and A, I was uh, gathering uh, questions, and I, sorry, and I think there are still a few that uh, remained unanswered. Uh, feel free to correct me. Um, one was from Eva Makal Ohara from the University of Warsaw. It's a very um, short question. How is the distribution of the European holograms for the European student card going to be handled? I think we haven't addressed this issue yet. Yes, yeah, so uh, maybe I can reply to this question. As uh, the the distribution of the hologram, well, the distribution of the holograms, putting the holograms and the QR code, this is a part of the second lot of the tender. And uh, this will be addressed within the new, with this big new contract. So, for now, we cannot, uh, we, we cannot share any information. As first, this is not yet publicly available, and second, um, the project has not been yet um, put put uh, put in motion. So, in the upcoming months, hopefully, uh, even earlier, you will have the, you will have this information uh, much clearer. Vicky, if, if we may, we were discussing in the chat in parallel with Alex how great of an idea is uh, suggested here by Dr. Ibrahim Yorgun about uh, the, the fact that IT offices are not so clearly understood by IROs uh, and in turn also IROs by NAs and NAs by us. <laughs> there needs to be a lot of talking so that we all speak the same language. But uh, I think it's a great suggestion to have a meeting, particularly for the IT staff at HEIs, where the IROs could also be present. I don't know how this could be organized, but from our, whether this is also something Unica would be interested in, but also from our end, I think we will take forward this suggestion and make sure that in this new tender, we have a, 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 a forum where, where also IT staff can participate from HEIs. I think that's really, uh, really a great suggestion. Absolutely, and that was also raised by Karin earlier. And I would like to address the question from Karen from Norway. An additional problem to be solved in Norway, we can be fined for promoting or using systems that are not universally designed. How this is for the rest of you? So I, I roll the question back to the rest of you. Uh, I don't know what is the situation, but the idea with the new ASCII that it will be universally designed. This is what we're we're aiming to that it will be there will be a harmonization it will be as accessible as possible so I hope that this um, that this replies to your question and maybe uh, Karen you could share also uh, if the technicalities of that maybe with your uh, digital officer so we can also have more information from the digital officer and this also goes to all of you in case you have further questions um, you can always turn to your digital officers and ask them we're in constant contact with them uh, and they they can always address the question to us in case they don't know how to reply well, thank you very much. Um, now we are coming to the end. So I would like to ask Romita and Mina to kind of close the, the info session. And meanwhile, I will um, put the link to the evaluation survey there. So please take the time. It's around two or max three minutes and share your um, your impressions uh, with us. And remember uh, the presentations that are already available. Um, we can we have put it in the in the chat, and we will send it um, to you afterwards. Uh, I mean after the event. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Vicky. 
Well, first of all, I'm really glad that so many of you participated today and actively were involved with the discussion with your really good questions. And I think we got, we really uh, touched down the practicalities, I must say, and our daily life problems that we have with the Erasmus process and, and with, the, with the Erasmus program. So what I will promise to you in our group is that we will follow up this discussion. We will keep these topics uh, under discussion next week when we will have our next meeting and we will uh, modify the questions and the topics to the to the um, our daily life, daily life like focus so that we will really benefit from these discussions and we will follow up the, the themes that we we found very important today and I see there are many challenges I, I, I don't under, underestimate that but I was there when 2016 we launched the last Erasmus program and we managed that and now we will have uh, another kind of future uh, ahead of us and I'm really positive that this will be easier maybe maybe not easier but at least that will be different and and, and I'm really happy that I have all these colleagues these colleagues around me to solve problems with me and also to create that cooperation that we need among Erasmus program thank you See you next week. Uh, thank you very much, Mina. From the EduLab perspective, we uh, taken on board three or four main ideas for our uh, further discussion. One of them is related to the position of our universities and uh, the responsible staff members uh, through the information on how the tools can be used and implemented in their institution. and. Um, do it in an accessible language and with concrete technical support, uh, supportive aspects. We are uh, working now um, in a very important initiative uh, uh, linked uh, to a repository and of course a glossary linked to clarification some uh, aspects on the European uh, political uh, aspect linked to higher education. This is the same context. Also, the European universities are the pioneers uh, for innovation and teaching and learning. And from the EduLab perspective, this is a, an important a rigorous solution in order to provide some common educational offers, innovative learning and enhanced digital mobility based on this initiative presented uh, uh, by uh, the Erasmus Plus team. The universities, the third idea, um, need also the European scale understandings on the concept and the processes that are in place in this moment for digitalization process and learning across Europe. And we are doing now for uh, the job um, on synchronizing uh, all semantical aspects and clarifications in, in terminology. And the first, uh, which is not the least one, the students must be active actors in developing and uh, implementing the innovative tools, not just for, for some technicalities, uh, but also for disseminating them among their peers and colleagues. Because, and this is the final sentence on my side, what we are discussing now is the quite revolutionary change in the landscape of our education. And this is probably not, uh, it's a certainty for the next uh, part of action. Thank you very much all. Thank you very much, Nadia, for sharing with me wonderful uh, half an hour uh, discussion in, in the uh, room one. Thank you very much for you all. Thank you very much to all of you. So especially Nadia, Alex and Luana, and also Vrakislav, Romita and Mina. And uh, yeah, we will send everything as, uh, as promised. So have a lovely day and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you, bye. bye Thank everybody. you for having us. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.